So the main reason why agents don't have time for kind of relationships, don't have time for physical health, mental health, don't have time for community or friendships is because of an unwillingness to allow or to learn about systems. Ain't it the truth? Yeah, ain't it the truth? And it stings, but it doesn't make it any less true. And in both of our experiences as kind of coaches and consultants to very highly productive real estate agents, one of the things that we talk about, and we were just talking about, you know, prior to getting started was this idea of the difference yes. between being busy and being productive. Yes. And, and what teamwork really looks like, what collaboration really looks like, whether you're a single agent and you have a transaction coordinator that helps you with your pending to closing process, there's collaboration right there. What are all the things this person could do for you? But there's pride in the beginning, right, that you can do all the things that you can get the CMA and that you can do the packet and you can deliver things. And there is a thrill in that getting it all done and being really busy. And <laughs> then if you're yeah. lucky, you get really successful. And now that's not so thrilling anymore. Now it's become a habit. And now it's something that you have pride in uh, and that you associate with the money that you earn or the value that you bring or how you feel worthy. And that is no longer necessary. You very succinctly just described a psychological pattern that I see that keeps the majority of agents stuck at, you know, yes. kind of levels of production that they wish were more, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 transactions. So it begins yes. with not an inaccurate assessment of reality of what their job actually is. Yes because then, the job is evolving. That's right. And thinking that my job is to do uh, income servicing activities when as a salesperson, my job is to do income producing activities. Yes. Then what happens is, is kind of creating this sense of pride or the story that we tell ourselves, like nobody can do it better than me. Yes. And what I share with people is like a lack of, when they say that to me, you know what I really hear them saying, and I'm curious to get your thoughts. When they say nobody can do it better than me, I'm like, oh, you don't trust anybody. Yes. And so I think there is a security in I connect my activity and my busyness to the money that I earn and the quality of the service that I give so that my clients want to work with me and consider that a competitive advantage. So I think that is a belief structure, number one. It mm -hmm. can be true in the very beginning, but then the evolution of that success is also being able to look in the mirror and that, you know, and be real with yourself that we're not good at everything. It doesn't mean that you can't do it, but it doesn't mean that that is really where the highest and best use of your time is. This is where I, I use, I use a rope as an analogy. So in the beginning as an agent, all the tasks look like they're one thing. They're your business and these are your tasks. As you begin to evaluate it, you actually realize there are threads put together that turn into a rope. And this is that you're the salesperson and in the middle there is servicing and then there is three paperwork and compliance. And these are three separate jobs. But in the beginning, you were doing them all together. And so now to also be able to evaluate your business like that and recognize in order for you to achieve and have time, money, and location freedom, you want to be able to have leverage. And so then your identity can move from being the entire rope. And you can do it that way, but you'll have a quality of life that is commensurate with that. Or you can begin to recognize that other people are experts in those individual areas. And now let's find them and try that out and dance. So it's learning to dance in a choreography rather than just free dance and all, you know, freestyle all by yourself on the dance floor. And I believe the way that we see metaphorically is the same way. So you said like, hey, if you want to do all of that, it's awesome. You will have a quality of life that is in alignment with that which means that traditional success in our business, even for agents, I find it so interesting to me, like, you know, they'll be like, yeah, you know, I do like 20 deals. And they're like, oh, I have no time. I'm so busy. I'm like, bro, like, I was doing like 180 deals, coaching like 100 people. Like, what do you mean? I'm a dad, like I'm a husband. What do you mean you don't have time? Like you got a ton of time. Mm -hmm. But this is the reason why. So you can do that. 
you'll just have a quality of life that's in alignment with that, or you can change your mind. And as you were speaking, one of the things that I wrote down was like, one of the keys, I think, to me selling real estate in high volume, hundreds of deals a year for, you know, 11 years in a row, was just an accurate assessment of reality on what my job was, which was prospect lead, follow up, go on appointments, negotiate deals and everything else. I didn't even view it as my job. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't even view it as my job, like it wasn't even in a consideration for me to do it. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm like, nope, because you not had, you had, ex you had extracted that. I had extracted that mentally first. And then I had to mm -hmm. fill in with systems and people. Yes. To do the other things. So and this really is an important separation of what do you want to do with your business? And, and do you consider it a business? Are you an agent part-time and this is your hobby and this is what you like to do on the side or you do this part-time and you make enough money? And that's totally fine. If you decide that this is a business and now you have certain things that you want to achieve either for your family financially or in your community as someone who is of service to the community because buying and selling property is an important service that you often need during one of five life events, right? You're getting married, you're having a baby, uh, you're getting divorced, someone died, or you're relocating for a job. These are the top five reasons people often buy and sell real estate. They need someone they can trust. I wrote down a couple of things. Um, one is, is you can only grow to the proportion that your systems will allow you to. Yes. So what I find so interesting is I see these agents and they spend all of their time, which is important, particularly at the beginning, is learning how to sell, like what to say and how to say it. Yes. And they will continue to keep going to these kind of learning events to try to craft what to say and how to say it better. And what I'll tell them is like, look, uh, I don't care how many of those you go to. I don't care how much, you know, rah, rah you get. I don't care how motivated you get. You will not be able to do more deals until you get your systems right. Because mm. if you took 10 listings right now and you're used to taking three, every, yeah. your whole life would fall apart. And you won't be able to do that consistently. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding that causes one to, if they're committed to growth, if that's what they want to do, causes one to say, right. hey, this is something that requires attention. This is also how you get off the roller coaster in the real estate business, right? Because if you get those deals, you go from three listings to 10 listings, and then you service them and service them, and then bang, now your revenue is going to drop because you've been servicing. And so do you want more consistency and you want to build a system that, and when we say system, we don't necessarily mean a software. I mean, it can involve software. It actually technically doesn't have to involve software, but at this point in time, there's really no reason to have it not have software. Um, but it doesn't matter even what the software is. What's important is the workflow. Who is doing what? We call them swim lanes. Who's in what swim lane? And then what are the proper handoffs? And as the lead agent, what is the dashboard of information that you have ac accessible to you at your fingertips so you always know what's going on in your deals? What I can tell people if you're listening and you're like, ah, it's not my thing. It wasn't my thing either. And I don't think you have to be like an expert. I just think you have to understand that it's important. And I don't have to understand the intricacies because like Gabriella, um, she helped set up our follow-up boss. And I really don't know. I, I understand how it works generally. I understand, yeah. you know, like action plans and like why they're important, like all that stuff. I have no idea the technical component of how to do it. So I think and to your runs, point, it's it like- it still runs, right? <laughs> and it works and it's fine. Yeah. So I think- for agents, I you used to be able to get away with very little technical knowledge. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, you could just be kind of really good on soft skills, speaking to people, enthusiastic, dynamic, whatever, you have good relationships, yeah, and you'd be like fine. Four pieces of paper you had to fill out. Yeah, you know? like literally like three pieces of paper on a contract, like that was it. Mm -hmm. And as it got more complicated, and now you have like, yes. you know, 30 pieces of paper that need to be signed which is crazy that we're still signing paper, but you know, it's, it's like, mm -hmm. uh, as time progresses, that'll change. Um, and agents started doing more and more volume and with technology and software that I believe the agent of the future, if they're not doing what you're talking about, if they don't mm -hmm. think in systems or have somebody on their team that thinks in systems, if they haven't outsourced that skill set to somebody, 
If they right. don't understand the importance of actually utilizing a CRM, not just as a mechanism for leads, but as a mechanism to build your business on top of, yes. because it has tasks in place and all these other stuff. I believe the truth is, is they're not going to be able to compete with these technology companies where that's what they do. Yes. And I think this is also a way in which to maintain a relationship-based business and not a transaction-based business. So with the technology has also come the ability to free ourselves from certain tasks mm. that can either be reminded automatically or actually executed automatically, which then frees up our time and attention for the relationships. Mm. So that we can really not only use the CRM, right, the contact relationship management to have the standard operating procedures and then be able to be in the relationships because then the agents who will really be able to dominate the market. So this also goes into the duplicatability, if that's the proper word, <laughs> of your business. So let's say that you've been in real estate for five years and you're experiencing some, some success now. And you depend no matter what brokerage you're with. And then you realize that you're, you would love to be an, I mean, you could be an agent until you can't walk and talk. Do you know what I mean? You could be a real estate agent for a long time. So over the span of time in, in having this business, there are going to be people who come and go in and out of your business as support. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of work. So the standard operating procedures are also the insurance policy. They are the home warranty plan. What popped into my head is if our bodies are the hardware, our brains are the software. And mm -hmm. we live in a time now where what I can do is I can basically download my software and put it to a place where other people can have access to it. Yes. And then they can use it, which is pretty yes. wild because that never, <laughs> like, like prior to the first iteration of that was just writing stuff down. So I was like, okay, yes. that's the first iteration. But the problem with that is not everybody can access to it. I have to be physically next to the thing that's written. And well, you can't just we... talk about, you can't just talk it all the time. It's exhausting. Yeah. And so now it's, we have technology that allows me to download my software to a kind of uh, storage in an SOP that can live on the cloud that anybody can has access to, and then they can use my software. So every phase of the real estate business has needs a workflow. So the, what do you do when a lead comes in or that you, you know, find one on your own? What do you do with that? That's a process. Now, how do you, what is your system for lead follow-up? And because what is the uh, percentage, 70, 80% right of business is in lead follow-up. So now what is that process for lead follow-up and which part is the salesperson doing and which part can someone else do so that you can go get more leads? So then now, yay, someone wants to have an appointment with you. It's a buyer, it's a seller. Okay, that's a process. And who's doing what part of that? So who's the receptionist? Who's the nurse? You're the doctor as the salesperson. Yep. So now what's that now? Okay. Yeah. You went to an appointment. Now we have the next piece. People want to see property or they want to list their house. Okay. Now that's a, a, the next process. Now someone wants to make an offer and or receive offers. So now that's a process. Yay. We have a ratified offer. Someone's going to go through to the end. Now we have a pending to closing process. Now we have a deal that closes. That's a process. And now what do we do after it closes in order to get more leads? And so we use it in a clock and it goes around and around. And the more you're able to, I'll say, nurture the post-closing and the lead and lead follow-up, right? Then the more you have in terms of executing to have contracts happen. I wrote down a couple of things. One is thousandaires think in time. Okay. So they think, what do I need to do? Millionaires think in systems. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> because it's just a hundred percent accurate. I'm like, wow, that's totally true. Because the people that I think about that are like, oh, I got to do this. And they're always thinking, okay, what do I need to do? What do I? And then the other thing that I'm aware of is like, there's this other, like you were saying, like, it's a belief. Uh, I think a lazy mind's answer is to work harder. Now, I know when I say that people get upset because like culturally we have this like hustle culture and you got to like grind yourself we into do. the dirt sort of thing and into the dust. I know people that work hard as hell. Like my dad is one of the hardest working people. I know he has been up every morning 
and and work from nine o'clock to like six to seven o'clock every single day, six days a week for 35 years and for a long time. Yeah. He doesn't have any leverage and he doesn't have any systems. And as such, he always has to be there to do it. So he doesn't, he has very little margin for other things, yeah. right? So, and yeah. that's, he's a smart, he's not a bad person. He's a good dude. He's like a smart guy. Yeah. It's just, that's- It's a choice. It's on the menu. And it's, it's, it's on the menu. And it's also, I think there's a hard- cultural undercurrent that that's the way and yes. i believe we believe that that's the way because 50 years ago it was the way correct it is no longer the way correct. <laughs> like so this, it, it is know, no longer and, just hard work like it is not just i'm gonna just work my ass off and i'll be all right it's like no that's not true yeah so we have two layers there um to just explore for a minute one of which is you know before the, the industrial revolution people had to work hard because you were working with hand tools and everything was you know craftsmanship and made and it was hard and to do more of it you just had to do more of the same thing then the industrial revolution happened and machines got invented and now we had to conform to be able to have repetitious boredom but we still had time and money in order to make things and so now we have a culture that associates the busyness and the time to worth. Yeah. So now post um, COVID, we have complaints that the workforce, the young workforce doesn't want to work like that. Let's also be honest. Who really wants to work like that forever? Yeah. So why let's what let, let's use that approach of how can we make it streamlined? How can we make it simpler? How can we make it excellent, but also have ease put into it? So we say that we take in our business agents that feel like they're in chaos and that they are in worry about how things are going to get done, what's getting done to move that into having a step by step system. So they have confidence, relief, and ease in order to achieve the results that they say they want. Yeah, I love that. And it's a really, really valuable service because uh, without it, as we just discussed, you are essentially, whether you're conscious of it or unconscious of it, you are signing up to a hamster wheel of being on a transaction treadmill in which, unfortunately, uh, for most, they never get off. And I highly, highly recommend that you reach out to Kathleen. She's the best in the business at what she does. Her energy and enthusiasm is kind of infectious. And <laughs> it, it is that way because it comes from an authentic place. So I appreciate uh, your time and look forward to mm -hmm. uh, collaborating in the future. Me too. Thank you. So 1989, the Chicago Bulls draft Stacey King. Stacy was a high-flying player out of Oklahoma, and so they pick him with the sixth overall pick in 1989.